Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. My name is Michael Glickman. I'm the president and CEO of the Museum of Jewish Heritage, a living memorial to the Holocaust. We'd like to welcome you here to the museum this afternoon and welcome you to the program Encountering Genocide, the Legacy of Civil Resistance Against the Nazis. Our panels today commemorate the 75th anniversary of crucial acts of civil resistance in Denmark. We honor the Danish citizens who took a heroic stance against the Nazi persecution of Danish Jews. This past Saturday, 11 lost their lives in the deadliest anti-Semitic attack on US soil. As we are cruelly reminded of the evil that has threatened Jews throughout the ages, we remember the moral bravery of the Danish citizens who resisted, who fought, as decent people the world over must continue to fight. In the past 20 years, the museum has welcomed more than two million visitors and helped to educate over 800,000 children. We have emerged as the primary resource in the tri-state area for the teaching and learning about the Holocaust. And we have become the third largest Holocaust museum in the world. Among the treasures of this museum is our off-site artifact, Gerda III, a Danish workboat used to rescue Jews from Nazi-occupied Denmark. Some of you joined us last week on an excursion to see and meet and experience the Goethe. That visit and today's important discussions reflect our mission to be a living memorial to the Holocaust, not simply a monument, but an institution of learning, understanding, and community building. I'd like to acknowledge our co-presenters, the Consulate of Denmark and Humanity in Action, and personally thank Macon Derno for her help in organizing the event. We're honored to have with us Ambassador Riggleson, who will present remarks in commemoration of the 75th anniversary of Danish Rescue. Today, we do the important work of learning the lessons of history. By doing so, we honor the humanity and dignity of those slain, and mobilize the memory in our shared fight against this most ancient of hatreds. My hope is that people of good conscience the world over will heed the lessons of this remarkable chapter in history and join in our shared fight against hate and apathy. Thank you for being here, and it is my pleasure to welcome the ambassador. Director Glickman, distinguished guests and speakers, friends of the museum. In the early fall of 1943, in the course of just a few days, 95% of the Jewish population in Denmark went underground, prompted by warnings from Danish civil servants and members of the recently resigned Danish government. They were hidden in churches, schools, hospitals, and private homes, assisted by their fellow countrymen, until they could be guided to small fishing towns or points along the shore and wafted across to safety in neutral Sweden. The rescue allowed the vast majority of Danish Jews to avoid capture by the Nazis. Those seemingly small in the overall context of the Holocaust. The numbers from Denmark speak for themselves. Over 7,000 Danish Jews were saved in this extraordinary act of civic resistance. Close to 8,000 if counting their non-Jewish family members. Less than 500 were arrested and deported to Theresienstadt in Czechoslovakia. Of those interned here, none were sent into the death camps as part of a special guarantee made by the Germans to Denmark. Almost 400 survived the inhumane conditions and were able to return to their homes on a caravan. <laughs> I know. 
on a caravan of white buses as part of a recovery operation jointly facilitated by the Scandinavian governments and aid organizations in 1944. 60 of the Danish Jews were deported. No, 60 of the Danish Jews deported perished due to starvation and harsh conditions in the concentration camp before the war ended. Please join me in commemorating every single of one of those precious lives not saved. It is to their memory that we dedicate today's symposium. The Danish rescue operation in itself was improvised and spontaneous. It involved thousands of risk-willing ordinary citizens and civil servants mobilizing at remarkable speeds to hide large numbers of Jews in just a matter of days and hours. As such, it is considered to be one of the largest actions of collective resistant, resistance to repression in the countries occupied by Nazi Germany. Let me haste to supplement this remarkable story of the Danish exception, exception by emphasizing that, as far as civilians elsewhere in German-occupied Europe goes, Danes were nothing special. Not more heroic or courageous than, say, Polish, French, or German. Notably, it was a German diplomat Georg Dukwitsch, who first alerted the members of the recently designed Danish government, maybe even by order from head of German occupation admi administration in Denmark, Werner Best himself. Warned that the impending operation to round up the Danish Jews were drawing near, thus allowing for timely warnings of the Jewish congregation and community. However, Danes were different in one important respect, and one that ended up making all the difference. Danes were individual citizens in a highly organized and well-functioning society. A society with strong institutions strong traditions of solidarity and collaboration, and a strong sense of community and good neighborship. <laughs> Danish society then and now was and is characterized by a high degree of trust, whereby, for instance, neighbors feel comfortable handing over their keys, if they lock their doors, to near strangers to water each other's plants while away. This crucial factor, I shall argue, ended up playing an essential role in the ultimate success of the rescue operation. So when in late September 43, the warning came, many people offered their help to Jews in need by conveying warnings, and finding hiding places, arranging for food and transportation to the coast, all of which was done at a considerable risk and under illegal conditions. Doctors, Lutheran priests, university students, trade unions, Boy Scouts were particularly active in the early phases of the rescue work. Later, the resistance movement supported the operation with coordination and economic resources for the Jewish families lacking the funds for the escape and crossing. But all along, it was the strong institutional networks and the strong sense of communal trust that enabled brave individuals to offer up their assistance. The Danish police and Coast Guard 
also took sides with the oppressed by refusing to assist in the manhunt. Not to mention the Wehrmacht soldiers, some of which reportedly looked the other way, moved by compassion or bribes. Geography, one could argue, also was an important factor in achieving success. The proximity of the Swedish coast was only a few kilometers in some places. Even then, getting over there could be dangerous and tragic. But it was possible, especially because Sweden welcomed the Danish Jews unconditionally. Let's not forget that. So what lesson can we learn from the story of the Danish rescue? Several factors were at play. I mentioned a lot of them. But again, let me return to the well-functioning society and strong democratic institutions. That was really the foundation. And perhaps something which is not that tangible, that Danes considered the Danish Jews as countrymen. Countrymen. It was our Jews. This was true in late September and early October of 1943. And this is true today, when our increasingly unstable and predictable world is crying, unpredictable world, sorry, is crying out for individuals and societies to come together in combating hatred, persecution, violence, and the waning trust in the very validity of historical narrative. This afternoon's symposium will address exactly these questions of how history played itself out, of what political and societal preconditions allowed for such unprecedented acts of humanity and civil resistance. Further, we will find an opportunity to ask ourselves, what is the legacy of this memory today, at this present moment, when the very premises of honoring a legacy and establishing historical truth are being placed into doubt. Please join me in welcoming our highly qualified lineup of speakers and scholars from both side, sides of the Atlantic. Enjoy this program. Thank you very much. Hello everyone, I'm Miriam Heyer from the Museum of Jewish Heritage. I'd like to invite our first two speakers to the stage and I'd like to tell you a bit about them. I also wanna take a moment to welcome the audience that's with us via live stream online. So welcome to you in the room, but also to those who are online with us today. So in our first panel, uh, we will listen to accounts of history from Poland and Denmark told by Konstantin Guibert in conversation with Andrew, Anders Jericho. It's my pleasure to introduce these distinguished panelists. Uh, Konstantin Guibert is a noted reporter, professor, and activist. Born in Warsaw, he has become one of the most prominent war correspondents in Poland, and he was recently awarded with the 2018 Rockauer Award from the American Jewish Press Association. Guibert began as an anti-communist activist in the 70s, he co-founded the Jewish Flying University, an underground educational movement, and the Polish Jewish monthly magazine, Midrash. Since 1992, he has been an international reporter and columnist with the leading Polish daily newspaper. He's the author of 11 books in Polish, which have been widely translated, including into English, on topics ranging from Yugoslavia to Israeli history to biblical commentaries. Welcome. Anders Jericho is the chair. Yes. <laughs> Anders Jericho is the chair of Humanity in Action, our partner in today's events. 
In his native Denmark, he is well known as a columnist and frequent commentator on international affairs with a particular focus on human rights and the Middle East. The author and editor of several books, he is active in newspaper journalism, and he served as president of Danish Pen from 2005 to 2015. Welcome. Just a note on our panels, this is the first of two. Between the two panels, there will be a coffee break and a time for discussion. I do hope that you'll join us for both of these uh, discussions, and you'll see me again when I introduce the second one. Thank you. So, hello everybody. I don't think, yes, now it works. Welcome and thank you very much. We are very pleased to be here. I am slightly envious that you have the view. <laughs> But feel free to watch it instead of listening to us. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so we represent two very different countries from the Holocaust history. I, I suppose we are, to, we are supposed to come from the country who, which fared the worst, Poland, and the country who was most lucky in terms of how the Jewish population managed to to survive, and we are, will be trying to uh, look into the question of narratives on Poland and Denmark, into the question of whether people had a chance to see what was coming before the, the Holocaust, and we will be looking into the question itself, the question of, of heroes and non-heroes in uh, these Holocaust years. And uh, I, I'm I will start. My own story is that my mother was a Finnish Jewish uh, girl at the time of the war. She was put on a boat to Sweden with a name tag around her neck uh, in a boat without her, uh, any grown-ups from the family. A boat taking her to Sweden where she was uh, put in a hospital for a month uh, to be fed again after a fairly hard time in Finland. Now, we always wanted uh, to hear the story of what happened in Finland and what happened during her flight to, to Sweden, but uh, in reality we never had the story because she was, uh, it was so hard for her to talk about it that we didn't have it. On the other side of the family, I remember one of my grandfathers talking about the, uh, the flight to Sweden uh, and the years he spent there. Uh, what put us in Denmark after the war was that my grandmother coming from Finland to Sweden fell in love with a, a new man coming as a refugee from Denmark and after the war they all went to Denmark so uh, we ended up being Danes, whereas I probably was meant to be Finnish. <laughs> uh, but uh, the narrative in Denmark, I think we basically have three, and they are very different. Because when the, the, the public, the media, the politicians speak about what happened in October 43, they usually talk about the rescue of Danish Jews. It's a very... Uh, positive story, it's a heroic story, it's a nice story because it has a generally an, a very nice end. Uh, but it's about how the Danish society rescued Danish Jews. But I think there's another narrative and that's the one I heard when I was a child. Because that wasn't a, a story in the first place of rescue. Because when you have a story of rescue, you need someone to be in danger. You need someone to be rescued. And the narrative of people needing the rescue tell the story in a different way. That's not a rescue story. It's a story of fleeing to Sweden and the necessity to flee to Sweden. And it's quite a different story, I have to say, because after all, the, the necessity to change identity from a 100% Dane to a 100% refugee is very uh, traumatizing. And I think we have uh, some very um, strong uh, 
uh, stories from that side of, of that part of the narratives. Uh, my editor, uh, Herbert Pondik, whom some of you may know, uh, he used to tell the story of how he went to school every day, and every day in September 43, one morning he got up as usual, he got dressed, he had his breakfast, he went to the high school, but during high school the, the headmaster knocked on the door and asked uh, Herbert to come outside. And the headmaster told him, look, you have to go back to your parents, tell them to get away, you can't sleep in your own house tonight. And Herbert Pondik is telling this story to, to, um, to, to get the po to the point that in a split second he was transferred to just one of the guys, one of the lads in the, in the classroom to a refugee, to someone who was identified not by his, what he, his, his abilities in mathematics or whatever, but into the only thing he couldn't change, his identity from birth. From that moment on, he wasn't just a Dane. He was the Jewish guy who couldn't sleep in his own bed at nighttime. And now when he's, I think he's 94, he still says that if you wake him up at night and press him on, the, on his stomach, the first picture which will come up is the memory of that split moment when the headmaster told him, you cannot go back to your own home. From that moment, he was a refugee. And from that moment, he knew that the word being refugee cannot be changed into tenses. You cannot be refugee in the past sense, he says, because once a refugee, you are always a refugee. Once a refugee, you will never come to terms that the fact or the, the notion that this cannot happen again. So it changed him for the life, and it changed, I think, all 7,200 Danish Jews who couldn't go back to their own beds, their own kitchens, their own places that night. So to them, the narrative is not a narrative of rescue. It's a narrative of being turned into refugee in your own country, into the narrative of fleeing. And in fact, there's a third narrative, which I think uh, is often forgotten in Denmark. Uh, it's forgotten in the general public as well, to some extent, within uh, the Jewish community. And that's the narrative of the 500 people who had to go to Theresienstadt, as the ambassador mentioned. This, in fact, is what it all uh, was about. The, the question of whether Danish Jews should be deported to uh, a, a concentration camp. We don't know if people at the time knew about the death camps, but they certainly knew that going to Eastern Europe or Central Europe wasn't good news. They had the fear of going east, and if the Nazi uh, occupation power had had its will all 7,700 would have gone to Theresienstadt. Only due to people like the headmaster and other people we will get back to, it was limited to 500. But these 500 experienced the fear and the, the fate that they were all afraid of. Being arrested and deported, put on a boat, put on a train to a place they didn't know in advance a place that where they didn't know if they would ever be able to go back. The reason that is a narrative in itself, and for many years we have had a very hard time speaking about the reason that in Denmark. But before coming back to these questions, I'll turn the floor to you, Konstantin, to have the Polish narrative. Um, thank you. When I hear the Danish story of the many things that make me turn green with envy. One thing is the numbers. 60 Danish Jews lost their lives in Theresienstadt. Out of my family of about 190, nine survived. It, it's a horror of a completely incomparable dimensions 
once you forget the individual dimension, individually, it doesn't matter if you're dying as one of 60 or one of three million, you're dying. But when you think of yourself as part of a, of a people, the, the difference in experience is staggering. And uh, when I was listening to your fascinating dissection of the three narratives, and um, this quote from Herbert, that um, he realized that he's no longer a Dane, uh, but just a refugee. I must say my first reaction was, what were those people thinking? We're Jewish, right? Being a refugee is a constitutional element of being Jewish. I mean, it, it might be great fun to be Danish. And I love Copenhagen. Sometimes. But um, don't let's get carried away. I mean, we even have a special holiday every year reminding us that we are refugees. My wife of blessed memory had set up Poland's first NGO providing relief to refugees in, in the early 90s and it's part of a European network. And um, that network would meet every couple of months in a different European city to coordinate. And she told me that um, on, the, on the network, there are usually there's one or two people who aren't Jewish and kind of feel they don't belong. Refugee relief is a Jewish business. I mean, look, in your Finland, I don't know how many hundred Jews there are, but nine of them are the Finnish refugee board. So, <laughs> <laughs> and listening to the story of your mother, I was thinking about my mom, who was, um, before the war, a um, nice middle-class Jewish girl in Warsaw, and she immediately became a refugee. She fled east and then returned as a soldier in the Polish army, having spent two years in the mud, in the trenches, with a machine gun, very effectively killing Germans. And that part of her life, I had to piece together from what her comrades in arms told me, because she had spent the rest of her life reinventing herself as a lady. And Ladies don't do those things, right? In the mud, um, with hardware, like killing people they were never even introduced to. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, I mean, we all owe our lives to our mothers. But I think I owe mine twice over. Not only the way we all do, but also because she had risked her own life for m the right of me to be born. And then I think of the overwhelming majority of the other family members who were not lucky enough to be refugees. Being a refugee is not the worst thing that can happen to you. Being dead is much worse. We had nine survivors. And when I was listening, Madam Ambassador, to your, to your fascinating presentation, uh, I fully agree with your description of what were the internal factors, a strong civil society, democratic institutions, considering Danish Jews as compatriots, which enabled this extraordinary act of solidarity. But I think there was one factor that trumps everything else, and that was the nature of the occupation regime. Uh, just in neighboring Norway, the occupation regime was different. I, I think that Norwegian society was not entirely dissimilar from Danish society. But most Norwegian Jews were deported. Not because the Norwegians were lacking in solidarity or democratic institutions, but because the willing of the occupying power was much more brutally implemented in Norway than it was in Denmark. And in Poland, um, the implementation of that will went beyond anything else that we saw anywhere else in Europe with, um, with one exception, actually, which I think is worthwhile to mention because people often forget it. Poland lost 20% of its population. Belarus, 25%. And um, one, one reason why we don't remember Belarus is that Belarusians have drawn the very logical conclusion 
We just don't want to be remembered. Please don't notice we're even there. Go somewhere else. But 20%, one in five, it's um, like, well, okay, this group here, right? To, to my left, you're dead. Uh, that changes a country. And to an extent, Poland has still not recovered from that trauma. Once we understand the fundamental importance of the nature of the occupation regime, it then makes sense to look at other factors. Because while the nature of the regime is the general determinant of the way people will act or not act, each individual uh, makes up his or her own mind. The fact that in Poland we had a very strong ethnic society in which solidarity was based on commonality of blood and origin rather than a shared civic identity was one factor. Jews were, as a Polish historian put it, beyond the limits of solidarity. They were simply not one of us. The fact that um, Poland's democratic institutions were weak, did not have the time to develop, and were strongly subverted by this sense of ethnic society was another factor. And the fact that Poles did not consider Polish Jews Poles was a third. In all fairness, we didn't consider ourselves Polish either. We were not a denomination, but a nation. And in Central Europe, politics was made by nations and in the name of national interests. Many Poles, even if they would not necessarily sympathize with the German goals, would ask, well, why should we help another nation? These, among other factors, and I hope we'll have the time to explore the other factors, were some of the elements that make the difference between the fate of the Jews in Poland and the fate of the Jews in Denmark fundamental. But the basic difference is the different fate of the occupation. Um, I don't remember the number of non-Jewish Danes who were killed under the Germans. Um, three million non-Jewish Poles were out of the six million Polish citizens murdered. And this is a, a scale of brutality that destroys humanity even in those who are unwilling to relinquish it. Terrible numbers. Um, we would try to go into the question of, of did, did people, did society know what was coming? And um, this is a, a question frequently raised when talking about the Holocaust and, and Second World War. And I think the most uh, frequent answer, the most common or popular answer is, oh no, how could we know? And this, this answer is, is normally used to explain why nothing was done or very limited amount of effort was done uh, to prevent the Holocaust from happening. Uh, I beg to differ. I, th I think it's, it's simply wrong to say that people couldn't know what was, what was coming. Well, maybe the existence of, of the death, the industrialized death camps w uh, remained unknown to most until late in the war. But quite frankly, a lot of alarm bells were ringing very early, and certainly alarm bells that uh, showed in which direction uh, Europe and Nazi Germany was heading. As a matter of fact, the alarm bells had been ringing constantly since 1933. Hitler himself and his book Mein Kampf, which was distributed in huge numbers, was an alarm bell by itself. His seizure of power, his, his uh, decision to cancel democracy, wasn't that an al 
a warning to Europe? Wasn't that uh, uh, a, a call for the rest of Europe to stand? The Nuremberg laws, the decision legally to discriminate Jews and, and Roma people, didn't it allow people to know what was coming? The crystal night in Germany and Austria and places, uh, I think it was covered in, in the media all over Europe, in America as well. Uh, how could we later say it was difficult to know what was coming if we had read uh, the news stories from the Crystal Knight? The, I think the first uh, concentration camp, Dachau, was established already in '33. How could we say the, the idea or the, the, the whole uh, the whole notion of concentration camps was uh, coming as a surprise if the first camp was established already in '33. We knew from our diplomats, from media coverage, from refugees coming out, that the SS was starting its work. We know about the violence, we know about hate speech, we know about the legal segregation, the discrimination, the we know about the thugs using violence against uh, Jews and other minorities they, they didn't appreciate of. I remember uh, a, a Danish rabbi, Markus Melchior, came back from Germany in the 30s uh, with a very, uh, very vivid and, and uh, realistic experience of what Nazism was about. So he went to see the Danish people in the Danish government and people in the leadership of the Jewish community in Copenhagen, only to tell them that this is serious business. What uh, Nazi Germany is up to requires that we stand and that we are serious about stopping it before it gets worse. And he had, I think, the same response as Jan Karski had uh, a few years later, the underground Polish um, resistance figure who um, traveled through some very nasty experience of, of uh, Nazi occupation and came out to see the British government and the American government. And he had the same response that Markus Melchior had in Denmark in the 30s. Uh, Markus Melchior was told, Please, please, hold your head down, Key, stay low, don't um, confront Germany, don't provoke Germany. That was what the government wanted him. Please don't uh, risk that Denmark will be seen as uh, an enemy of the Germany, of the Nazi Germany coming. And the Jewish in the Jewish community, they told him, please, take care. We have to take care of, of our society and not risk um, be seen as a problem to the Danish community or the foreign policy of Denmark. So Markus Melchior went, went back to his wife, highly, um, highly uh, distressed, and highly uh, depressive, realizing that neither the government nor the Jewish community was prepared to stand up facing uh, Germany, which still was in the early Nazi years. I think when Jan Karski went to the British and American government, he was told, we don't uh, claim you are lying, but we cannot believe what you are saying. But the answer was the same stay low. And my um, take on this is that the, the possibility that we didn't know about the, the industrialized death camps is being used to, as a kind of cover that we didn't know all too well very early about the Nazism developing. And we use it as a cover for the fact 
that Europe wasn't ready, and America probably not either, not ready to face Nazi Germany while it still wasn't as strong as it was in 1940. Um, the question, did people know, was misleading. And I agree with your conclusions. People did not know about Auschwitz and Treblinka. These were radical innovations in the history of human creativity. But people did know about Nuremberg Glows and Kristallnacht, and the general reaction was, we've been there. I mean, this is Europe, right? What do you expect? And we know we can survive it. The point is not to aggravate things, not to make them worse. And frankly, I, I'm not sure if we can stand in judgment of our grandparents who saw but did not see when today we have democratic governments who call entire ethnic groups criminals, a caravan of rapists paid by the Jews, incidentally, trying to invade this glorious country, uh, my government proclaiming with pride that we will not allow one single refugee on Polish soil, as if we did not know what this means. And the answer, of course, is, okay, it's not Auschwitz. Yeah, frankly, it's not good enough for me. The fact that, as of now, we're not murdering people on an industrial scale is, to me, not a reason to feel relief. But I'd like to return to Karski for a moment, because the conversation you alluded to, Karski was an underground fighter in occupied Poland who got smuggled out by the Polish resistance and flown into Great Britain to brief Churchill and then this country to brief Roosevelt on what he saw, among other places. He visited the Warsaw Ghetto and the subcamp of the death camp in Helmno. Neither of the leaders were terribly interested in what he had to say, but um, Roosevelt told him to see Frankfurt. <coughs> <coughs> to see Frankfurter. And Karski did see Frankfurter and delivered him a report on what he saw, to which Frankfurter said, young man, I cannot believe you. Karski stiffens and says, uh, Lord Justice, I, I'm, a, I'm an officer in the Polish army. And, Kar and Frankfurter responds, no, no, you misunderstood me. I did not say you're lying. I said I cannot believe you. Well, he was of, of that last blessed generation which simply could not conceive of building industrial facilities for the murder of hundreds of thousands and millions of people. Today, we all know it's possible, right? If somebody tells us that a facility of this kind has been set up in Darfur or in Myanmar, well, we'll be appalled, but not surprised, right? We know this happens. I think it's worthwhile to reflect for a moment on this knowledge, on the fact that we all are fully aware of the possibility we might be surprised about its implementation, but not about the fact that it actually happened. Frankfurter genuinely could not conceive of that. And I think that's a fundamental transition in human history. But pretty obviously, even if the Nazis had not committed genocide, even if they had just named a group of people criminals by birth, deserving to be discriminated, denied their rights, robbed, beaten up, this is still something I think people should react against. But we don't necessarily react against such things happening now especially when they are endorsed by governments that have democratic mandates. I don't think we are in a very good moral position to point the finger at our grandparents. 
which makes it even worse, <laughs> I would say, if w the lesson of our grandparents in a totally different situation isn't being learned of when we face uh, genocide today. But uh, before getting to that, I'd like to uh, get back to the question of, of what happened in in the um, in the Danish affair, October '43. What what made uh, Denmark end up as as the lucky one with most uh, people surviving? After all, Denmark had been leading the same policy as most countries in in Europe. We also refused to accept refugees from uh, Nazi Germany. Denmark, in fact, also, or I don't know if I should say also, but Denmark accepted the German Nazi occupation. Uh, we didn't put up a war, and no other countries put up a war on our behalf. It was a fairly peaceful occupation. And after all, Denmark accepted to cover I think on average some 15% of, of uh, agricultural needs in Nazi Germany in our export, even while, uh, or continuously, while we were uh, occupied. But of course there are a number of buts in this leading to, to the, uh, to the uh, very lucky end that most people survived. As a matter of fact, the, the Danish government continued under German occupation until August 43, and it had uh, a few conditions. One of them, that Nazi Germany wouldn't change the humanistic uh, nature of, of Danish society, and the second one, that they wouldn't introduce anti-Jewish legislation. Uh, well, they did ban the communists in 41, but that was accepted by most Danes, although not a very proud moment of, of Denmark. But until that moment of August 43, the Danish government continued, uh, and the fear of what might happen was mainly in the Jewish society. We don't hear a lot about it, but I remember a few years ago I made a a fairly big source collection of, of uh, all sorts of printed material, private uh, diaries and official documents from the period around for October 43. And I was in the National Archive of Sweden where I suddenly found an application from uh, one of my grandfathers applying in Copenhagen to have a visa for Sweden. Uh, already in in the beginning of forty <coughs> of forty two, and he was refused. I was surprised only because uh, I didn't know he had tried as well. But all people, all Danish Jews, were refused asylum or visa to Sweden during the war until October forty three. So in a lot of ways, we had behaved as other countries had. We all, I think you also know the story of the Danish king. Uh, quite humbly, Danes uh, usually say, look, he didn't ride his horse uh, through Copenhagen with a uh, Magen David, with a Star of David on his uh, shirt. But in fact, it was very close by. Because a few years ago, his diary became open uh, to researchers. And in his diary, you could read that the king in a meeting with the minister uh, in winter between, I think, uh, winter between 41 and 42 is asking his minister about the development of, of um, regulations for Jews in Nazi-occupied Europe. And the king is, is uh, worried that these very bad times would come to Denmark. The minister doesn't say very much, but then the king says, well, if it comes to that, we will all have to wear the Star of David, which I find very nice. No one asked him uh, to say that. No one challenges him uh, to react or to show what he would find reasonable to do. 
but out of his own mind, he suggests the minister that this is what we should do. Times developed differently, and in October 43, the Danish government stepped back due to uh, a German uh, crackdown on the resistance movement, and they introduced an emergency, introduced death penalty and things like that. So the government withdrew, and that opened for a rivalry between two historic uh, narratives again. Who were the heroes? Who were the bad guys? Now, one school of, of historians will claim that the heroes are the, the secret servants who managed to keep Denmark uh, on its feet during all these years and uh, managed to to get out of the war without more uh, Jews being sacrificed to Nazism. If ev even if uh, only by cooperating with Nazi Germany when necessary. That's one school of thought. The other school of th thought is, look, this was just a reaction to what was necessary, but the real heroes were the people in resistance, the people facing uh, danger, and even with the danger to their own life, they rose and got involved in, in resistance to the Nazis, and later got involved in helping Danish Jewish countrymen uh, getting away to Sweden. And these two schools of uh, historian thought uh, still is in a very active uh, rivalry on who were the heroes uh, of Denmark. I think it's indisputable that the um, that the civil administration did play a great part in, in uh, limiting uh, conflicts with the Germans. But uh, I have to say, I think uh, the resistance and people concretely helping countrymen finding refuge uh, um, that, that we owe them a special uh, respect uh, because they did it uh, even uh, not knowing how dangerous it would be to themselves. And I think that makes the difference. Anyway, there were four possible reasons for the rescue to succeed. One was the gentleman, the ambassador mentioned, Dukvic, the German naval uh, diplomat who led the word pass to the Jewish, to Danish politicians who then warned the Danish community, Danish Jewish community. Um, another factor was uh, the German, the Nazi hesitation to spend too much force on only 7,800 Danish Jews. Um, I think it's accepted knowledge, historian knowledge today that the German head of occupation in Copenhagen, Werner Best, uh, who was not a very humanistic kind of character, he saw his own si situation as a kind of dilemma. He needed to please Berlin to start a deportation process of the Danish Jews. On the other hand, he knew that his own position as head of the uh, Nazi administration would be easier if he let uh, some or many of the Jews escape. The third factor, obviously, was the Danish resistance and the population. Most of you have heard about the fishermen. I, th I personally uh, uh, feel proud on behalf of Denmark to realize that it was fishermen, but, but not only fishermen. It was all kinds of people allowing other Danes whom they didn't know to sleep in their place, who helped them uh, being put in hospitals in false names and under false uh, diagnoses. We have the most uh, extraordinary stories about these uh, hospitals helping uh, Jewish refugees. One of them was in a, a very big hospital in Copenhagen, Bispebjerg. One morning, 
someone at Bispebjerg realized that the Nazis were putting up uh, all sorts of cars around Bispebjerg and apparently planned uh, to 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 storm the hospital to pick out uh, the Jews. Someone had someone had told them the story, and within two hours they arranged a funeral procession. <laughs> so they they came up with a huge. Uh, a line of cars, ambulances, and other cars with uh, presumably one dead person in the first ambulance. But in the rest of the cars, you had uh, Danish Jews. And for reasons unknown, uh, the Germans wouldn't obstruct the funeral procession. So they allowed several hundred uh, Jewish uh, um, patients from the hospital to leave as part of the funeral procession. This was done by nurses and doctors and porters and all sorts of holy, uh, completely normal people. They needed only a few hours to plan it. And I think it's, it's a wonder that none of them went to talk to the Nazis and ruin the operation. Those were the heroes, I think. And then we, d we need to remember one more group of heroes, and that's the country of Sweden. Sweden had refused to accept refugees until then. They, have accept, they didn't accept Jewish Danes until then, but when the moment arose, Sweden accepted to open it ga its gates, its ports. It's a truly uh, uh, unbelievable step to take at that moment of the war, but they did it, and they allowed these 7,200 Danish Jews to arrive. And I think if you ask Danish Jews coming to Sweden or remembering coming to Sweden at that period, they all remember the phrase uh, Welcome to Sverige, welcome to Sweden. So, I think we need to, to realize that it may be that the Germans let it be somewhat easier than originally planned and certainly easier than feared. But this was not a, a game and it was not a cat and mouse game. It was a uh, an operation between a deadly military force and people f fearing for their lives and the people helping these peop these refugees from Denmark did what no one could ask them to do they they showed readiness to to risk their lives to help countrymen now i think we sh if you'll allow me just 2 minutes more we should add the, the story of the, the Danish Jews in Theresienstadt. Because as you mentioned, or I think the, the ambassador mentioned, they weren't transported further on to Auschwitz. And this was due to a very delicate diplomatic um, um, negotiation play between the, the Danish uh, civil administration, Danish diplomats, and Nazi Germany in a time where when the Nazis fear that they wouldn't win the war. So they probably had a feeling that they could get a few of the good points by assuring Denmark that the Danish Jews in Theresienstadt wouldn't be sent further on to Auschwitz, but be allowed food packages and later be allowed the transportation in the white buses back to back to not Denmark but Sweden one of my uncles was uh, uh, a doctor he was Swedish Jewish doctor from Sweden he was part of these white buses and he told this uh, terrible story of of joining the buses driving down through uh, Nazi Germany which was already in total destruction uh, knowing that uh, his identity was enough to be 
uh, arrested and sent to the camps where they were going to bring out people. Uh, I think to to the the to the people going with the white buses to Theresienstadt, uh, we find a lot of, of true heroes as well, willing to go to help countrymen out of the heart of, of evil. Uh, I could talk for hours, but I won't, because I promise to give the word to Konstantin Gebert, please. Hopefully kind, thanks. Um, even though I know the story of, of Denmark under the occupation, each time I hear it, it is like listening to a fairy tale. Now, Poland under occupation not only wasn't privileged to have a government that can impose conditions on the occupi occupying power, um, like specifying number of suitcases that um, Jews are allowed to take to Theresienstadt, guarantees that they will not go to Theresienstadt elsewhere, Goodness, threatening to resign if the rights of Danish Jews would be infringed on. We didn't even be lucky enough to have a quizzling government. The Germans were simply not interested. In their racial scheme of thi things, the only good thing that could be said about the Poles was that they were a rank above the Jews. But they didn't want to sully their wealth transforming scheme by Polish participation. Had they asked for it, they would have got it. Um, anywhere else they asked for local cooperation, they did. But they didn't. In Denmark, the penalty for helping Jews was running the risk of serving a couple of years in jail. In Poland, the penalty was being executed on the spot with your family and neighbors. And we have documentation of literally hundreds of cases of Polish families thus murdered. More importantly, even, um, while for it, it does appear for most Danes it was obvious that Jews were part of the civic community and Danes, therefore, for most Poles it was obvious Jews do not belong. Um, Anti Semitism developed very deeply in the interwar period. And um, had it not been the fact that we got invaded by our even more anti-Semitic neighbor, I can imagine Poland developing an anti-Semitic regime of its own with discrimination of Jews. If not genocide, I don't think we we're simply well organized enough to, to undertake such, a, such an endeavor. Uh, the fact remains that not only it was terribly dangerous to help Jews, and um, many of the people who refused help refused out of understandable fear. I, I realized that only when I had kids of my own. The idea that I may be risking their lives to save a stranger did not sound appealing. Not only that, but um, very effectively implementing the principle of collective uh, responsibility, Germans would execute neighbors for having to denounce people who harbored Jews. Therefore, um, if you knew that um, your next door neighbor was hiding a Jewish family, your life was threatened and that of your family. On top of that, you had a very pervasive anti-Semitic movement that was very strong in Poland before the war and deepened during, frankly, I find it very difficult to imagine it would have been otherwise. So imagine yourself a Polish peasant. You see, after the invasion of an army of Goethe's and Beethoven's, that Germany was the most advanced country in the world. Everybody aspired to be Germany. If that country decides its, its most important military goal to kill all the Jews, even more important than fighting battles on the front in 44, when rolling stock was desperately needed to transport troops from the Eastern Front to the Western Front, um, still sending Jews to Auschwitz got priority. If that country puts all of its effort into murdering the Jews, if n the Allies don't seem to mind very much. By 44, Western allies 
had the possibilities of bombing Auschwitz. After they occupied northern Italy, they took over the airfields, they could fly there, and they did. You had American bombers flying over Auschwitz to bomb Monowitz, a factory of synthetic rubber five kilometers from the camp. Not one bomb was wasted on Auschwitz as the, the bombers flew above. Earlier, the Soviets had the same capacity. Nobody did. The Pope didn't protest. Apparently, humanity had decided unanimously that Jews need to be done away with. So imagine saying, okay, against all that, I still believe that people should not be killed, and I'm willing to risk the life of my children to save those strangers. No, not in this human race. It is obvious that um, Polish anti-Semitism, the hostile attitude of the clergy, the experience of brutal conflicts with Russia, the interwar period, all those impacted on the fact that the survival rate of Jews was extremely low. But the fundamental difference still remains. If you make uh, an occupation vicious and brutal enough, if you're willing to murder people it, by the hundreds of thousands for disobeying your rule, you will make people do what you want them to do. It wasn't only Polish, Polish society that was viciously corrupted. Polish Jewish society as well. If you think about the Jewish police in the ghetto, this is not an issue of free choice. These were people terrified and terrorized and he knew very well that the lives of their children were at stake. They also committed horrible things, not because they were Jews, but because they were placed in a position in which no human being should be placed. Uh, David Reif, um, the, the American journalist with whom I um, worked for time in Bosnia, in his book on Bosnia has this devastating sentence. He says, after Sarajevo, after Srebrenica, we know exactly what never again means. It means that never again shall Germans kill Jews in World War II. That's all it means. And I think he's right. I mean, post-war histor historical record shows him right. But there's a very minimum we need to learn what it meant for the Germans to kill Jews in World War II, what complicities could they count on, and why were they so effective. And obviously, it's very easy to say that um, this was a German crime period. In a way, it even appeals to um, this German myth of Germany going its own separate way, different from everybody else. We're not only Beethoven's and Goethe's, we're also the greatest criminals. Um, however, this crime would not have been so very successful had Europe not collaborated, and it did. We have the Danish exception, possibly because Germany wanted to preserve Denmark as a kind of, well, museum of what Europe used to be before we won. But um, everywhere else, there was enforced or spontaneous <coughs> collaboration. Without the Polish peasants, the French gendarmes, the Swiss bankers, the Hungarian authorities, less Jews would have been killed. And um, in this sense, obviously, it's not over. I think this is when we should ask the moderator what Does the international community have a responsibility to 
heed the alarm, um, presented the alarm, alarm presented by Trump and his administration. Why are they not doing so? Welcome to humanity. I'm very happy this question is for you. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to humanity. Given half a chance, we want. Um, if there is any lesson from the 20th century, it's this, that even if we know 